Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. This is such a fun episode, uh, talking about kind of decoding gurus. I actually thought my guest is so really level-headed and and balanced and uh, and empathetic and and um, like uh, if if anything, far far more. Uh, understanding about about some of the uh kind of various conspiracy people and stuff out there um getting all all the all the clicks and attention and selling anti-vax merch and whatever other pathetic uh stuff that people with no dignity do but um i wanted to uh I wanted to uh, uh, just note that this was actually recorded before all of the Spotify, Joe Rogan um, controversy. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to say a lot about it other than to say that this is, I need to set that up because you might be wondering why we didn't mention it. It was recorded before that, before, um, you know, a guy who intentionally gets into controversy for a living got into controversy. Whoa, surprise. And uh, I don't really, uh, uh, boy, I guess I just don't care about Joe Rogan. Um, he already got like another $100 million offer. <laughs> it, it's like, it's all, all his sycophants are, uh, you know, <laughs> post a bunch of like memorial pictures. This is my friend and I see stand he's a good guy maybe he doesn't mind having not good people on his show all of the time i don't know how good of a guy you can be. maybe you're just interested in awful people but in a good way um so uh yeah i i mean i i don't have much to add um to the conversation it just seems like par for the course uh in this day and age more stuff like this is going to keep on happening maybe we'll talk about it more uh in in the future um i i'll i have like some guest book to you know the thing is i'd like to just give people COVID information and then i it's like i gotta if you if you want to see if you want to see a good Joe Rogan clip to see like his core of where he's coming from, just Google uh, Joe Rogan yelling at a primatologist uh, and him peddling some like basically Bigfoot theory on a radio show and a primatologist, a female primatologist, uh oh, female primatologist called in to tell him that it wasn't real and he screamed at her um and well mocking her for being a woman i guess and that's really at the heart of who joe rogan is and people can change and they can evolve and some people don't do that fast enough so that's i guess where i stand on the whole joe rogan stuff um, I'm glad that I don't have to peddle a bunch of supplements, um, and, and whatever else, uh, you can support me on Patreon. Um, if you don't like that, I stand up to Joe Rogan, you cannot support me on Patreon. What do you think? I'm going to tell people that it's okay to not get vaccinated because you'll throw me a few dollars a month. Nah, I have more respect for the whole of my fan base than I do for the couple wacky outliers that just need their little conspiracy scary tales to be true and need there to be a whole plot working against them. That's not the mo uh, the majority of you guys. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here listening to this show for for years. So uh, when we talk about to actual scientists that aren't trying to get a uh, uh, you know, that most of the time don't even have it today, I guess, is an exception where my guest has a podcast and uh, is on Twitter and everything. Um, but 
generally just having people on to talk about all sorts of different things. We're going to be talking about science communication coming up, and I'm going to start working in more animal episodes. I'm going to try to shoot for like one animal research episode a month on average because uh, um, I've just been watching a bunch of animal documentaries again, and it's rekindled my just joy that I have in learning about nature and realized I got to be doing more of those episodes. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, in terms of, uh, in terms of the Joe Rogan study, I'll, I'll provide some more information for you guys. Um, it's unfortunate. Like I, I don't, I'd rather just give you the information rather than, you know, having to run through why ivermectin is like probably not terribly effective if effective at all and like break all of the like it's just such a waste of every everyone's time for me to sit here and get researchers on to explain why the Loch Ness monster isn't true rather than talking about just actual interesting things that are in the ocean but we live in a world where we have to deal with a bunch of uh, conspiracies and disinformation, and um, and I, I know people are looking for uh, more valuable resources and things because because you have you go out and about, and then you have you just um, you know caught off guard by people parroting things from that they heard from Tucker Carlson or. Rogan or something and throw a bunch of word salad at you that you have nothing to deal with and, or, you know, no, no means to cause who's following every stupid thing that those guys are putting out there. And, uh, and so I don't know. I don't know how to approach all that. Um, you can, you can, uh, leave comments in YouTube if you want. You can follow me on Twitter where I, I mean, it's, it's fun. It's where I go to blow off steam about all of this stuff. Um, I mean, I, I annoy myself on Twitter, quite frankly, so I wouldn't blame you if you got annoyed with it as well, but I go on there and try to keep an eye on all the various, um, credentialed, uh, grifters that want to be, uh, that want to be celebrities and trying to get on uh, Rogan and Russell Brand and all these other people's podcasts and, and use pander to them using their, um, you know, thinking up sciencey word salad sounding things to uh, pedal to what they want to hear, not presenting. Um, you know, those guys aren't seeking out just randomized science; they're seeking to have their own crap validated to them. So I guess I'm going to have to do the same and start seeking out more people for, for a specific purpose rather than uh, once in a while, rather than uh, randomizing things like I normally do. But that's what I think, um, I guess, when it comes to Rogan. I have lots more thoughts than that. Um, like I said, I share a bunch of them on Twitter. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Listen to him when he talks to MMA people or has celebrities on or something like that. Not a great source of medical information, though. Okie dokie. Enjoy this show. It's super fun. It was cathartic for me, as you can tell. I'm just, like, a little tired and annoyed with all of this stuff, as we all are. Um, so, yeah. Enjoy today's episode. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast, guys. I have a, a this is this is an exciting podcast for me. Those of you that have been following me uh, around for this journey of the Here We Are podcast, I've been eight years. I spent it touring around. I look up random academics and various cities and. 
uh, have them tell me about whatever weird research. Maybe they study ticks or uh, or MS or whatever else and uh, just be like, that sounds interesting and learn about all sorts of random things. And then COVID came along and I just kept on doing the same thing that I always did and had no idea the blowback that science generally was going to face from the public, not from you guys, but just trying to present um, sci- uh, just regular old scientific information to the public uh, was suddenly a taboo thing that people would get up in arms about. And I didn't really address it too much on this show over two years. And I've been starting to more and more uh, lately, as you've been hearing, but we're going to uh, be talking about some of the aspects that led to that a little more head on in this episode, because I found out about another sciencey podcast hosted by two scientists called Decoding the Guru. And I was like, ooh, this is my jam. So I reached out and I have one of the co-hosts on the show joining me today. Matthew Brown is joining me. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thanks for having me, Shane. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me all the way from Australia. Um, I'm in the early evening, you're in the morning, um, and you host, it's funny, you host a show, uh, Decoding, uh, the Guru, uh, let's get into your other background as well, but this is FYI, since this is our first time meeting, this is the most guru I've ever looked in my entire life. This is a COVID <laughs> situation, <laughs> actually, and it's also the most issues I've ever had with gurus in my entire life, and yeah. the most i've ever looked like one so yeah. there's some fun paradoxes going on here you're slightly yeah you're you're re, you're reminiscent of rasputin just a tad so you know that's okay that's okay yeah. But hey, um, uh, my sex night life isn't rem- reminiscent of this <laughs> uh, unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> that's unfortunate that's unfortunate but it, 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 it is crazy though isn't it like you were saying about how you know we didn't see this coming nobody nobody had this crazy um anti-science thing on their bingo cards um when um, covid came along and i guess the um i guess the epidemiologists and the virologists are getting a sense of how the climatologists um felt and feel. yeah <laughs> I'd say so. What a fool I was. I actually thought that uh, when when COVID first happened, um, and I've shared this, when I first heard, I was touring around, I, I would do science shows where I'd have two scientists, I'd look up at every university, at a university I was traveling through, join me and come on stage and do like, I'd do comedy, they do like, a 10, 15 minute talk about their research. I'd riff on it and comedy and science show. And uh, like early February or end of January, 2020, I had a biologist cancel on me saying like, I don't want to be in a room with people right now. And I'm like, what's this hypochondriac <laughs> talking about? <laughs> and everything? And then, so, so when everything went down, um, you know, I reached out to past guests that I'd had on that, uh, yeah, the, uh, theoretically it are like theoretic mathematicians of that model pandemics and that sort of thing. And I was like, oh, this is quite serious. And I was like, well, this is even though all of my money just went away because I can't tour anymore. One of the good things is I have a science podcast. I'll be able to provide useful information to people yes. that people are going to enjoy. That's what I, that's what actually went through my brain <laughs> in 2020. Yes. And holy smokes, it's been quite an ordeal ever since. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, but, but that points to like one of the, the big um, the, the, the big challenges because you know the the natural instinct of a of a working scientist is to go hide under a rock because nobody um, nobody pays scientists to deal with this shit 
frankly, <laughs> right? And, yeah. And and they're not the most brave or enterprising or or, or you know, um, 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 they're, they're, they're not very social people to begin with. So, you know, they, they don't get excited when their mentions are filled up and when there's, you know, they're, they're blowing up on Twitter. So their instinct is to hide under a rock and try to focus on getting their work done. And, um, yeah. and but the instinct of, of some some characters is to lean into that and do more of whatever it is that gets more attention, generates more controversy, and and puts them at the center of the conversation. They're not usually yeah. the best person people to listen to, though. Yeah, um, it, it controversy sells. It's it is amazing um, how how rapidly. Uh, rumors and gossip uh, spread with humans. And actually, you know, before we get fully into this conversation, will you give the audience just a little bit of your background and what, what you normally do? And then, yeah, start there. Sure thing. Uh, so I'm currently a professor at uh, Central Queensland University in Australia. Um, I'm in the psychology department. And uh, we mainly research addiction, um, gambling addiction in particular. It's where a lot of our, um, our major re- research projects are happening with. Um, I've also done a lot of research on on uh, the nature of belief, like why people believe the things that they do, um, whether it's spirituality or conventional religiosity um, or, you know, things like anti-vax. And as it happens, I was doing research on um, vaccine skepticism, vaccine hesitancy and conspiracy theories and stuff. Uh, long before COVID came along. So that was nice. But at the time, uh, I thought, oh, this is just a little niche interest, but no one's going to fund me to do this and nobody would because it wasn't considered a big deal. How wrong we were. <laughs> but, um, so, but, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, but my background is weird because I, I started off in, in behavioral science, but I, I got into um, more mathematical um, stuff, signal processing, uh, image processing, video processing, mobile robotics. So, so my my first postdoc was in a robotics laboratory in Japan, um, and and then worked mainly as a like a quantitative scientist, um, like you know doing doing statistics and yeah, um, um, computational work, modeling and that kind of thing in like marine and atmospheric science and um, coastal engineering, like wind wave models, that kind of thing. So, mm. and I also had a short break building stairs, uh, with my dad. So, um, um, in his little business, um, but building big stairs, great big commercial staircases. So, so I've had a checkered, checkered past. Very cool. Yeah. I've, I've, I'm a former factory worker and did a fair amount of construction, no blue collar upbringing and stuff. I, I never went to college. I just was always reading science books and, uh, and, that's how I got talking with you guys. It's um, a good. Exp- I think it's an experience. Ever you know, it really benefits almost everybody to have to have these things. I mean, it's it's complicated and difficult work, um, especially mm-hmm. people that have these first world problems. And com- ac- academics like to complain, for instance, about the terrible <laughs> tyranny that they work under. Uh, <laughs> and they should, <laughs> yeah, they should try doing construction. Um, uh, it. Yeah. it- it is. I, w- I would love to, you know, that might be a nice, I worry we're going to be all over the place because I have a million things to chat your ear off about. But but there's an interesting thing with uh, right before recording, I was kind of sharing some of my background and how one of the one of my major interests is evolutionary biology and psych- psychology. And so um, because I got so obsessed with it like 10 years ago. I've kind of been following a lot of the various academics in it, and I noticed kind of early on it, my first my first show putting together or my first special that I tried to combine science and comedy together was called Mating Season. It was a special on Netflix, and and it was a lot of like the evolution of various mating behaviors. And so I saw like early on, you know, there's contention on on both sides. You have the right that doesn't believe in evolution and then the left doesn't uh like hearing about gender difference stuff sometimes and can Mm -hmm. can get a little iffy about that and and so i saw early on some of the pushback to uh some of that of 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 the the battling between the sociology and kind of the evolution departments and some of the 
um, uh, some of the is ought arguments and that sort of thing that happened uh, early on. And I thought, yeah, I mean, these these evolutionary thinkers should be able to present their research in whatever way they like without getting blowback. And then and then I I saw I saw these opportunities start coming up where it was then it just became a way that um, that people like Rogan and and others could find like, oh, here's an academic that will talk smack against the liberals in in these academic structures, these elitists and these academic structures that are, uh, uh, you know, the social justice warriors. And we can invite these people on to have see even these smart people say what's wrong with these liberals. And to me, yeah. it always felt like what you were kind of saying there, which was like, this is isn't this just a grievance with HR that you have basically <laughs> like yeah. if you work in a factory or anything else there is there's you, you know for for every for everyone that might think that um that a university is too liberal believe me there's plenty of construction and factory workers out there that think that it's a, a hair too conservative in their environment and <laughs> and may and maybe there needs to be a little more uh uh watching of what's being said around absolutely. in that environment yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah actually having worked in both i can only agree 100 <laughs> percent um the um yeah, look, uh, one of the things we do, um, Chris and I, on, our, on on the podcast is actually give people a bit of an insight into what it's actually like inside academia because, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, these these guru characters that we cover, like Jordan Peterson or, or whoever, often are wringing their hands and sort of catastrophizing. And it's, it's, it's become a trope, hasn't it, in the culture wars, how, mm -hmm. you know, the institutions and then universities in particular have totally fallen to this rampant woke ideology and now it drives every single thing that happens, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, look, it's certainly true to say that, you know, um, universities generally are more left-leaning than the public, for sure. Um, are the HR departments and the organisation, does it have, you know, these, you know, some, you know, diversity statements and things like that? Absolutely. But the th the reality sort of check that we try to provide people is to say, look, no, like, 95% of what academics do has got nothing to do with this political stuff. Right. You know? And right. They, at most, like, like for instance, at my, you know, at, at my university, like I don't know, like they talk about, you know, Marxists or whatever sort of, you know, everywhere and you have to, you know, kowtow to this ideology or something. I, I met one Marxist in my entire academic career of something like 20, right. year, 20 years. And and he was fired like three years after I, after I met him. Like uh, nobody talks about politics. I don't know what the, the politics of my colleagues. It's, yeah, anyway. So uh, it is a bit overblown is what I'm saying. And it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's just kind of what people attach to. So if I, if I use like, um, say a Rogan example again. Not not only do controversial figures have an easier time getting on a show like that, ju just in the same way that there's like, if any academic writes a book, they might have an easier time getting on like the Today Show or Oprah or you know, there's there's various uh, angles and niches and you know, part of PR. This is a good fit for this show, sort of thing that happens. Mm -hmm. My comedy was a better fit for like Conan O'Brien than maybe some of the like Jimmy Fallon or something like that. You know, it, it's it, it, there's a little bit of that going on and. Um, mm -hmm. And and Rogan's always had a fondness for, uh, you know, the more out there like UFO chasing this and that, and so, uh, and, and then and then like f fighting for free speech and that sort of thing. So there's an inroad there, but it's interesting because even even if Joe books people that aren't that, those guests don't get the attention that the controversial. Personal guests get like 
he had a guy, Keith Campbell on, who's been on my show that does personality research. That's yeah. s- would say like similar things to like what Jordan Peterson says in his personality research, but because it's not under the guise of, whoa, this guy's in this fight with this academic system right now. Just like no one cares. He didn't, yep. his Joe Rogan appearance didn't set his world on fire and, you know, like make him some huge famous guy, you know, like Robert Sapolsky isn't famous because he was on Rogan once, yeah. you know, like yeah. Brent Weinstein is because he got in some fight with, uh, with the university. Yeah. I mean, you know this, Shane, because because you're interested in you know you're interested in science and have done the reading and th- and that. So you know that this that even though we're academic issues and um, you know sciencey type issues has entered the discourse, as they say, mm-hmm. and is making a splash. It's not it's not it's not a fair representation of it. Yeah, it's it's this it's this sliver that can be sort of. You know, twisted for political ends, or creates controversy, or, or is it, or is it the fulcrum of some culture war mm. divide? And so, people are getting a very skewed idea of what goes on, and that's true of every discipline, but but particularly true of uh, evolutionary psychology, yeah, or just evolutionary biology in general, mm-hmm. where they're like, there's, you know, and it's it, it it's a nuanced thing because, as you said, there's like some really terrible <laughs> research. Right in that field, right? Mm-hmm. Just like there is in most mm-hmm. fields, right? But there, there really are, and those are the ones that get, you know, get this attention. Like, what fresh new hell is this? Look at this terrible thing. It's the, you know, the whole thing is terrible. On the other hand, there are genuine weirdo, sort of race realists and sort of, uh, or I guess, paleo conservatives who who mm-hmm. like to lean on these selective things from there to justify you know, weird, unpleasant conservative opinions as well. So, you know, I I feel for just a general person in the, the I feel for the public trying to wrap their heads around, you know, who's who's right and wrong in this who are the good guys and the bad guys in this scenario because it's it's complicated. And anyone sounds very impressive, you know, if you hear them talk and you don't have if 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 you haven't spent a bunch of time in your life learning about you know, evolution or personality differences or whatever, you know, you can hear some researcher that's done it and they can present whatever and say what it's going to sound great to yeah. you, you know, yeah. you're well, not the, even this is fields. One of, this is one of the things we try to, we try to focus on with our gurus. We got a bunch of things that like features that we sort of detect. And, and one of them is this, you know, um, pseudo profound bullshit. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, you can so easily use the academic y, uh, science y language, scattergun references, and, um, you know, string a whole bunch of big words together in this very elaborate, you know, sort of rubbing your chin kind of way. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, unless you actually have the, the background in that specific field, it, it works. It works well. So, you know, recently we were covering uh, Robert Malone and Peter McCulloch on the Joe Rogan podcast, and th- they were doing that kind of pseudo profound bullshit, you know, from the, from the medical end. And, mm-hmm. and, and we, we had to check with some, <laughs> with some people who knew more about them, more, a lot more than us about, about medicine and virology, uh, and who were just like, no. That's not right. There was one thing, there was one phrase that he, that was a great example of pseudo profound bullshit that uh, I forget who coined it, but they both mentioned it, which was, uh, it's, it became a big thing. Mass formation psychosis. Uh, uh, psycho- yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, and, and then millions of people started repeating and now found themselves to be an expert on this mass formation psychosis. <laughs> Just start <Not> parroting <laughs> mass, mass for, have you heard about mass formation psychosis? Oh man, they, everyone has this mass formation psychosis. And they're all up to speed on it. And but it, 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 sounds, it, sounds like it's, it sounds like it's a thing, right? It sounds like, oh, that's that's a that's a thing that sociologists or psychologists have been studying for decades. Um, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is it, it was I I had I'm I'm not proud of a lot of things that I tweet because I'm mostly blowing off. St- 
de- uh, Twitter is my one place where I just go to blow off steam and everywhere else I'm a reasonable person. But I had a f- fun one. I was like, we need a term for all of the people that suddenly believe in mass formation psychosis <laughs> that isn't mass formation psychosis oh no no uh, <laughs> mass, mass formation psychosis psychosis is clearly uh, yeah, there you clearly go the too easy um it yeah it's it, there's i i mean it, is there hmm which of the hundred directions do i want to take this so when you talk about someone like Malone, so I, I listen to an hour and I understand that I go in there with a head full of steam ready to call bullshit. And like, I have my own biases and like, I can't wait to jump on some sort of inaccuracy and everything else. And I'm already going in with the assumption that, they, but yeah, there has to be some things that people can kind of just look out for logically which one like word salad I, I i usually feel like if if someone doesn't understand something that's on this show like write me that was some failing of like you know maybe a scientist and i were hitting it off and we were using some shortcut terms to communicate with one another and i forgot that the audience doesn't know but generally it's the case that anything that's said on this show is going to be pretty understandable but i listened to here's something that you wouldn't need to be a a scientist to understand i listened to the first hour of the malone interview and he goes hey i have no incentive to be saying any of these things whatsoever no incentive and every all of the all of science is in on this plot and i'm the one whistleblower and then 10 minutes later he goes I have a special announcement. I've created my own treatment for COVID and it's doing this and that thing. And this is groundbreaking information. I'm about to save the world. And you'd think like, hey, maybe look out for stuff like that when there's clear motivations. (laughs) And 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 likewise, he he often emphasizes how, you know, he doesn't he doesn't like to talk about how he invented mRNA vaccines. Uh, yeah. It's not a big deal for him, and but he mentions it <laughs> every chance he gets. Like, I've, I've never, I've never heard him do it. And his 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 partner apparently was um was was kicked off Wikipedia for um like you know too much editing of, of the, his Wikipedia page to to, to write yeah, in that, that yeah, he yeah. was the one. Now that's not normal behavior, um, and it's not the behavior of right. someone who doesn't care yeah so look um to answer your question um yeah i got I, I got some advice there um i think but well i can i can give you a bunch of red flags i can give the list a bunch of red flags that you can that you can sort of tend to spot these because we just see them repeatedly amongst the people who are purveying bullshit across the spectrum right um but mm-hmm. before we and and, the, and by the yeah. way yeah oh, so, uh, i'll yeah. let you steer the ship go ahead yeah, and and, and when I say bullshit, I, I try to you know we try to make it not not so much our opinions, you know, like not not based on our values or political opinions mm-hmm. or anything like that, but just stuff that is provably, demonstrably misleading and untrue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but sorry, what what were you going to say? Um, I, I- well, I was just going to say ju- just just so uh, like I I just got in some uh, Twitter argument with someone today that was like. You're just jealous. You haven't been back on Rogan again, or something like that. Like I've been, ju- I've just been a skeptic for a very long time. <laughs> There's, a, mm-hmm. uh, but but when when you when you talk about some of these people, can you can you talk just so we don't make the whole conversation about Joe Rogan? Can you talk about like some of the other stuff that you see out there that you maybe talk about on mm-hmm. on uh, decoding the guru? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we focus on a bunch of gurus. So um, um, and we, we there's like a never-ending stream of them. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I could list off a few names so people have a bit of a sense. So uh, yeah, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, we started off kind of with the sort of IDW adjacent kind of group. Um, you know, Eric and Brett uh, Weinstein. Mm-hmm. The IDW is Intellectual Dark Web, by the way. I, I sometimes forget to tell people yeah. things that I already know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you know, Jordan, Jordan Peterson's a kind of classic um, guru. And, you know, our, our definition of gurus, we, it's a bit confusing because we have a couple of them, right? We, we cover people that we, we call secular gurus. So they seem to mm-hmm. have some of the properties of um, sort of traditional religious or spiritual gurus that are operating, operating very much in the secular space. So we thought that was interesting. And with that sort of encompassing kind of view, there's nothing necessarily bad about being a guru, right? Like we, we nominated a couple of our personal gurus. So I, like I nominated Carl Sagan, right? Because I, you know, just, you know, from as a as a kid just um, loved what he did. Now I'd definitely call him, you know, kind of a secular guru, right? He's got these broad ranging opinions and a kind of underlying philosophy and it's cosmic and, you know, it, it's it, it's more than just, oh, this is how a neutron star works, right? Um, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, with our podcast, we, we, we do tend to zoom in a bit on, on the sort of the more un, unhealthy, deceptive, you know, the, the, the uglier side of it. Um, so a bunch mm-hmm. of people have come across our radar, Scott Adams, Russell Brand, you know, Douglas Murray, mm-hmm. but we've also covered people like ContraPoints who, who and, and, you know, she, and she did quite well, Gwyneth Paltrow, who didn't do very well. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I could go on. Jordan, yeah. Um, so you know, if, if, even some of these sort of health and wellness people like Michaela Peterson um, is interesting and, and recently Peter and mm-hmm. Peter McCulloch and Robert Malone. So those are the characters. Um, but in terms of the stuff that we tend to see cropping up again and again, um, one of them is that sort of gal- – we call it galaxy brainness, right? It's fr- from that meme, you know, pfft. You know that sort of uh, from Tim and Eric's uh, awesome show. Yeah, yeah, the mind, yeah. The mind blown. So, so this is this kind of they, they they've got like if 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 they're giving hot takes and deep insights on like a whole bunch of things. Apparently, they're these super super duper polymaths, right? Um, it, when they've got a grievance, yeah, with 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 the powers that be, they off they so often have a backstory where they had they've been overlooked. Their stuff hasn't been properly acknowledged, and they're not getting the proper recognition they deserve. Right? Like if if you look mm. at both Peter McCulloch and Robert Malone, they've both got those backstories. Um, many of our other gurus have that too. Um, and this is connected to their tendency. They're like they they have narcissistic traits. You know, they 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 self aggrandize. They 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 do a lot of kind of manipulative flattery. They'll often, they'll often be flattering you, the audience. And saying, you know, you mm-hmm. are smarter. I, I, I'm not going to talk down to you. I'm not going to simplify this for you, like in a Kazurkas Act video, right? Which are great. Which those sorts of videos are great, by the way. But no, they 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 talk at this abstract level and flatter you. Then they make no freaking sense most of the time. But it, it's it, it's like you're in the club, right? You're in the you're mm-hmm. in this very smart people club. Um, and you know they're doing stuff like acting like a Cassandra. They're, they're warning of this impending doom. According to a lot of the gurus, right, they, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, you know, too sweet unless um, unless people listen to to their special message that they have for you. And what you know, we just we just talked about McCulloch and Malone. That you know, <laughs> they're totally doing that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they, right? They're, they're right. warning of this impending doom. So look, there's a whole bunch of stuff we mentioned pseudo you know, pseudo profound bullshit. But a big one, of course, is the conspiracy mongering. Yeah, a lot, a lot of it revolves around these dark conspiracies, these malevolent forces that are trying to they, they the they, yeah. And now, you know, um, so 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 those are the red flags. I think that I think anyone like you don't have to have technical knowledge of of vaccines or virology, for instance, to spot that say McCulloch and Malone are doing these these things or sh- or displaying these traits you just need your basic social intelligence that, that we use mm. when when dealing with people but look the other the other important thing is, is just sort of based around i guess what they call folk epistemology where where like like how do you figure out what's true right in this wild crazy mixed up world right cuz you know we're not an expert on everything you have to you have to trust people right you have to figure out who to trust what sources of information are good sources of information and what aren't and it it gets difficult because not everyone who's giving you bad information is raving on a street corner holding a you know a sandwich board 
uh, across their chest with wild and crazy hair. They could be someone like Peter McCulloch, who has a distinguished scientific record, or Malone, who speaks with a very authoritative, scientific-sounding voice, you know, looks the part, acts the part, uses the right big words. So how's a poor schmuck like, like me, a psychologist, or, or, or anybody, going to figure out whether you should trust this guy or not? And, and the answer is don't trust single individuals. You know, trust, mm. trust the, the, the consensus, for want of a better word. And mm-hmm. people often mistake that to think that the consensus is this kind of orthodoxy where everyone's in lockstep and everyone has to agree in exactly the same way. That's, right. how, that's, that's the kind of, um, that's the straw man version of it that these heterodox figures often yeah, present us, it as. Yeah. All the sheeple. All the sheeple. No, it's, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of sources. You, you'll see that, that it, it, it does form a relatively consensual network. You'll realize that there are issues about which there's uncertainty. Sometimes the consensus is wrong. Sometimes it, it needs to update and change with new information. And you'll be able to spot when, when voices are outliers to that. So when someone mm-hmm. like um, Peter McCulloch is saying that the pandemic was planned by the CDC in, um, in conjunction with Johns Hopkins and with the intention of killing as many people as possible um, mm-hmm. and actually withholding treatments like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine um, in order to kill people and sow fear in order to force them to take vaccines for some weird nefarious purpose, then you you can see that that's not... <laughs> that's an outlier take and it's it's not only not plausible mm-hmm. but it's not shared by your typical uh expert and specialist yeah yeah i mean i guess it's 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 tricky because uh so i'm i'm bipolar and so i i have sometimes i have manic episodes so i know what paranoia feels like i i know how emotion can just override cuz it's it's not so much that um that you think something is statistically probable it's it's this idea of like but if it is true oh my god the cost involved and if you think of something like um like pizzagate or something like that like if, if you if you know just more than you've known anything that there's some like child sex slave situation going on in the basement of a pizza joint and the police are in on it too and no one's doing anything about it like it you're the only one that can stop this thing from happening and my goodness if you're right you would you would be very valid in wanting to like burn that place down or whatever or take the law into your own hands it's just if you go and do that and then it turns out oh this place didn't even have a basement actually That's just, uh, that was just some rumor that you bought in. Well, guess what? You're the asshole in that situation. And the people that you harmed might be uh, press charges against you. They might also take action against the people that you got that information from. And, and which that's, that's also why there might be like liability involved in different platforms and stuff like that, that might be providing a platform for different conspiracies that are out there. And it, it makes things very, very, uh, mm. very messy to tease apart. Well, that's, that, that's actually another good way to do a bit of a, like a self debunking or, or a self check, um, even mm-hmm. without having the sort of technical expertise. Um, whereas that often there are some claims that are involved in the grand theory, the grand thesis, the grand conspiracy that you can check that are within your the realms of your expertise. Like, does the pizza joint have a basement? All right, that's that's something you could you know and you could figure out. Um, likewise, right. with um, with the sort of um, conspiracies uh, pushed by McCulloch and Malone, they'll often cite the amazing um, you know magical performance of ivermectin being deployed in say Japan or uh, Uttar Pradesh. Now, you know, as a, you know, everyone's little domain of expertise would be different. Amateur expertise would be different. But for me personally, I happen to have lived in Japan. My wife is from Japan. And I know for a fact 
that no one in Japan has heard of ivermectin, that it's that it's that it's in mm-hmm. fact you know never been you know never been widely deployed, um, but it is highly vaccinated. So that's clearly not true. So if if this basic fact that that this character is holding up as as one of the main you know as a you know important point is just just blatantly totally false, then that should that should you know, right. raise your eyebrow more as to whether you should be trusting this outlier view. It's, it, it is, it's really difficult because there's so much of this mentality, at least from my point of view of, of looking at people that like really buy into the, it's a lot of, if you find a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of trying to find slivers uh, of things. It's like, if you can find a sliver of doubt to not trust your medical, the medical community and, and, uh, the scientific consensus or whatever, like that's just a very interesting, uh, sliver and you hold on to that. Whereas, you know, if Alex Jones or something, when he's like going off, it's like, oh, well, you know, he's, uh, He's a wacky guy and that guy's just yeah. a character. He's a comedian. It's just wacky. Yeah. Like no accountability whatsoever. But then in the same sense, they go, Oh, but he did this one thing. What there was a sliver of truth to this one aspect of so it's 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 just yeah. there there's something about finding yeah. That it's it's like we like finding it's like we're all trying to find solve these Scooby Doo mysteries and we really like being yeah. in on this like hipster information or something like that. Yeah, um, but the other thing you're hinting at is the differential standards that are applied, and so you know yeah. when we're subject to motivated reasoning, uh, we'll often put put the put the claims or the evidence or whatever of the, the stance that we're not predisposed to like. Under this micros- uh, under this microscope, and do this kind of exception hunting. It's like aha, but you know this, you know, and, and you think you found this thing that's uh, that's that's the smoking gun that theoretically makes the whole thing unravel, and you don't subject the claims on the, the side that you sort of that you prefer um, to the same level of scrutiny. So that's 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 just one of the ways in which we can kind of delude ourselves with our own kind of, you know, doing your own research and, and fact and fact checking and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a tricky business. And look, one thing that can really help is just to, is just to have a bit of self-awareness about what your own, you know, preferences are, you know, what, what is the, what is the, what is the view on this thing that fits better with your personal worldview? And, you know, you, you could be like a, you know, like a libertarian anti-government, you know, loving freedom and all that stuff that, that could, you know, if you could have that self-awareness that, look, this is the kind of person I am and that is going to make you, you know, more, you know, distrusting and skeptical of these things and these other things will, will just naturally sound more appealing to you. If you're like a woke mm-hmm. social justice sort of type, um, then, right. you know, some, you know, it's, you're going to have a different set of preferences. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, Chris and I try to do that too, which is we just remind people and, Everything like look, this is this is where this is where we're coming from. You know, we we, we try not to make it relevant to what we do, um, but you know, we're just we're just you know fallible human beings, just like everyone else. We're not none of us are brains in boxes, just operating perfectly logically. Yeah, well, I I wonder what are. So I have no scientific training. I read science books. I talk with scientists, but I've never been formally trained but it, i i do think that the average person can learn to think a little more scientifically in terms of say making things falsifiable in terms of having a hypothesis and thinking okay well what would you expect to see if this hypothesis is uh is correct like, like here let me give you an example you you point out the gaps in my the many gaps in my logic here but I, i've been thinking um, about the way, as I feel like the tides are starting to turn uh, a little bit, like uh, as more and more, the, the, I feel like the truth is starting to win out with some people. And unfortunately, it's taking a lot of like lives and hospitals overflowing for people to see it. But, um, but it, now there's, it went from, you know, vaccines are, they're, it's a, 
plot to microchip us or genocide to kill us all off or whatever these these plots are it went from that to be like okay but do we all right but they aren't as effective as like what we had hoped and maybe these side effects are being underplayed to to like to then going well can you blame me for thinking there is microchips the government is you can't trust the government it's like it's the government's fault and like the scientific community's fault for like changing their mind on things that's the reason why i believed in mic microchips and now like i'm not going to take a vaccine how how can i trust someone that made me believe there was microchips in the vaccine <laughs> you know like like it's it's like this impossible like moving goalpost situation of and and i was just thinking okay if government trust is what is driving is the sole thing driving down vaccine rates, then then you would expect that places with the high amount, the highest amount of vaccine rates or something have the most amount of government trust in the best government and healthcare and everything else. And that's not always, that's not always a perfect correlation. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. uh, like not everyone wants to live in China or something like that, that has really high vaccine rates, for example, or there might be things about their government that are also, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. I think you can, you know, it's, it's hard, right? Uh, because we generally um, look for evidence that confirms whatever it is mm -hmm. our, our theory or perspective is. We look for confirming evidence and we go, aha, when we find it, we add that to the list of supporting things and we downplay and ignore um, stuff that doesn't quite fit. Um, now, it's a difficult skill to master, the, the, the practice of actually looking for disconfirming information. Like if my... Like, or, or rather, you know, if my, you know, if, if what I think is true, then I would expect to see this or I wouldn't expect yeah. to see that. And then going to check to see if that's there and then go, ah, oh, okay, so that that might not fit. And then actually reevaluating your theory, right? That's, that's evidence-based reasoning. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like if, for instance, you thought, okay, so... Uh, I, I think the American government is totally corrupt, right? Like a lot of Americans think this, right? Not without re reason, right? I, I think the American mm -hmm. government is totally corrupt and they don't have our best interests at heart. So why on earth should I believe them that they're trying to get us all vaccinated? Um, that they're, they're probably doing it for some one of a number of random reasons, right? So you go, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So if that's true, then would the government of Australia um, be – um, you know, it's it's a different country, right? It's it, um, right. Their government's but, different. You know, they're not. Um, you know, they sh it, it shouldn't. They they assuming the government's not as bad as the United States. They shouldn't be so, you know, crash hard on vaccines. And so you can go and have a look and go. Oh, it seems like the Australian government's like super duper keen on vaccines. Now, if you go, okay, well, that just means that they're in on it. So there's obviously a globalist thing where all the governments are cooperating. You know what I mean? What you've done then is you've elaborated on your theory. To, mm -hmm. you, you know, you've held on to, to your core belief, elaborated on your theory to accommodate the new information rather than revising it, all right, and coming up with and switching to a more parsimonious explanation. And that's essentially conspiratorial logic where you just keep elaborating on the, the conspiracy theory, adding new moving parts to it so it can basically accommodate all all data that comes along, whereas scientific thinking is actually going, uh-oh, that doesn't fit. Maybe there's a problem with my theory and revising it to another simple theory. <laughs> like maybe. Yeah. 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 You know what I'm saying? It, it, like, yeah. Like if, if you, uh, okay, 5G causes COVID. So you like look up where the 5G towers are and then look at the COVID rates and maybe you hope to see that COVID rates are higher where the towers are. Or maybe you find out that COVID rates are lower where the towers are. Now, guess what? You just figured out that 5G towers actually keep covid away you've you've just helped the world this is a solution that you found with your own with your own research but the 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 uh, joking of course but the idea being that that um it's hard to 
uh, people don't naturally think, how do I falsify my own beliefs? That's just not a natural thing that occurs to people to do. No, no, it's not. And, um, you know, even, um, you know, even, you know, practicing scientists get too attached to their theories all the time and um, need a, need a mean and nasty colleague to come along and puncture their bubble because they won't let go of their preferred theory. So yeah, mm-hmm. humans just aren't very good at this. Um, we, we like to think in narratives. We like to reason from anecdote rather than from data. Um, you know, we, we remember things and place weight on things on how emotive they are, how striking they are. Um, mm-hmm. um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're flawed creatures in so many ways. So, you know, p- part of it is just, you know, self-awareness, just remembering that none of us are particularly good at this and practicing a mm-hmm. bit of, they call it epistemic humility, right? Just, just a, a little mm-hmm. bit of humility, you know, um, you know you, sorry about that. My dog, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, it's not easy, but, uh, yeah, I mean, like, like you say, I, I think I, you know, I think I see positive signs, you know, green shoots with a lot of people contact us and say, look, um, um, you know, thanks. I was going down a bit of a rabbit hole with some of this stuff and, uh, you know, I've, you know, my bubble got burst and, um, you know, I'm feeling better about this now. So yeah, I, I, we, yeah. Shouldn't, we shouldn't be too depressed about it. Yeah, I, I mean, and a lot of those people turn around. I've, I have uh, one of my good friend, amazing artist, Jack Rowland, Australian. Um, he got into conspiracy stuff like early 20s and found himself out with a crew of people looking for hidden pyramids and stuff and like really pursued this. And then after a while it was like, Oh, wait a second. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, yeah. now I'm just digging in the sand with these <laughs> <laughs> lunatics. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it, now it, he's it, it, it like psychologically, it's a bit like falling into a cult. It's got similar sorts yeah. of dynamics, and and a lot of us think, and even people that have you know fallen victim to it, um, you know, feel, oh, how could I be so stupid? You know, oh, I'm, yeah, you know, right, and, and they, you know, or you know, and people that are frustrated by people that are you know have cultish kind of beliefs or conspiratorial beliefs, it's like, oh, how could they be so stupid? Well, it it's not about being stupid. You know, um, very smart people yeah. can can go down that rabbit hole and and end up in some very odd places, and you get there just one step at a time. Yeah, I am so happy that you said that because so so much of it, I I think to the average, not the average person. Um, sorry, I don't mean to characterize average, but but I I I get the sense that a lot of people are evaluating things based on. They're like sizing someone up and they're being like, yes, th- this person is smarter than this other person generally and, and or strike me as being smarter. And whoever the smartest is, is the person that we should listen to on all things. And yes. it doesn't no, it, it doesn't work like that. No, you're it, right. it, like there's plenty of people that. I, I mean, epidemiologists, like, off, I'm sure there's a lot of epidemiologists that have no idea how to change the oil in their vehicle. Not a <laughs> single idea how, how to do simple yeah. maintenance stuff on mm-hmm. their car. It's not, yep. it's not smart. It's, it's, in, it's, it's experience. It's, it's mm-hmm. training that, that goes in it and it seems like well, a little bit lost on. Well, there's even a name for this. Like you know, they call it as it um, was it Nobel Prize disease or something like that. So there's this yeah. like because there's this tendency or not a tendency, but there's been a surprising number of Nobel laureates, um, Nobel Prize recipients, who you know in in one field, you know, so they're like super, they're they're super smart, right? Super talented, hardworking, yeah. super duper experts. Um, and then they go on to proclaim that, you know, homeopathy can cure cancer or, right. you, know, you know, the human race was spawned by ancient aliens or something mental. And, right. um, and so, it, you know, it's just a good illustration of, of what you said, which is, you know, yes, yes, some people are smart, 
great. That's nice for them. But smart people can believe some very crazy things. So it, it sort of mm-hmm. comes back to what I said before, which is it, it really is important to get a sense of what the expert and consensus is because any one person, expert or not, smart or not, right, can be very wrong and very weird, and very strange. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, your best bet, uh, so the, the consensus is good, not because it's a consensus, but just because it's a, a, lo- a large pool of all the rel- of all the people with the relevant expertise and they can still be wrong right <laughs> the expert mm-hmm. consensus on climate change after 50 years of research you know might you know is well it's going to be wrong to some degree right it, you know of course yeah. no, no, no current consensus is going to be perfect um same with the epidemiological one same with any field that you care to mention but it's going to be better just by the law of yeah. large numbers than than any one sort of um, um, sort of figure, and and one thing you have to remember is that the in, there's big incentives for um, an expert or a, a scientist or a public intellectual of any kind to be that black sheep, right? To be yeah, that yeah. heterodox figure because you get all the cameras on you. You get invited on Joe Rogan. You get yeah, yeah. you get a million followers in a week, and you know some people are driven by that. You know it's not such an unusual thing, so it, it's you shouldn't be surprised to find like an you know or a few epidemiologists or a few climate scientists or you know or a few doctors who are saying that smoking doesn't cause cancer. Right, you'll always right, get a few right. because there's always incentives f- to, to to take right. the contrarian point of view. Yeah, it's it's. It's so I have on if you if you go to my Twitter and you go, I have a list of all of my past guests. I I took a couple of the I I had I had a few uh, intellectual dark web people on in the past. And I've I've taken, uh, I think, all of them off of uh, of that that list because I uh, don't like what they're doing. But it's funny because. Um, if you look at so you know randomly going to universities, uh, the this person um, studies voles and their mating behavior. Okay, I'll hear about that. Like, I never, I never once was like, oh man, this is uh, th- this person's gonna light the world on fire once people hear about how voles mate. <laughs> like everyone's going to, and and so because of that, I got to realize I. Well, most people, most academics aren't even on Twitter in the first place. If they are, they don't tweet that much. If they do tweet, they have like a lot of times a few hundred followers or something like that of other scientists. Sometimes they'll have like 5,000 followers, something like that. And if you compare that, just every one of those to any one of these intellectual dark web people that have like hundred thousand followers minimum um yeah, minimal. because they created this controversy because they got masterfully got attention to themselves and yeah. uh and stuff and man yeah people. like yeah it's just a you know it's just like what we said these red flags and the thing about red flags is is that they're not a deal breaker right like you can be mm. say a public uh, you know a pub you know be a you know um, promoting public understanding of science you could be being a public figure and so on and it doesn't mean that you're automatically just chasing attention and will say anything in order to get more followers, whatever. It's just it's just another piece of the puzzle to keep in mind, isn't it? Um, that mm-hmm. um, you know, if the you know that if they have you know a million followers, then then being a public figure and being popular is part of their job now. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that just 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 keep that in mind in terms of what makes them tick and what mm-hmm. it, what incentivizes them i mean th- like in in contrast like you said um like we we had a guest on um a, a virologist at king's college london uh, professor stuart j neal um very you know just your stereotypical hard-headed antisocial scientist <laughs> frankly mm-hmm. right but he's been working on on coronatype viruses and um, you know the, the, the like similar similar kinds of viruses for whatever 20 25 years yeah mm-hmm. that's that's his job right he he's been doing that forever and you know he doesn't you know so he's in a way the perfect he, for from my 
from my point of view, that's someone who I'll instinctively place a bit more confidence in. R- right. Yeah, because right. because yeah, same. He, he, he's not- He's not about. He doesn't have a podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doesn't you know? Um, you know, he's not about that, right? He he's and mm-hmm. he didn't just suddenly develop an interest in coronaviruses after it became a big deal, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so you know these these are just the little red flags, the little the little things that you know you can use your basic social intelligence and what makes people tick. Um, to to figure out, you know, how how much weight should I should I give these, um, you know, different voices? Yeah. I I also it's it's uh, you know, one thing I've been thinking about lately as I uh, look back through um, through pandemic history and stuff and just see the various. Um, the, the 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 patterns that ha- like the smallpox vaccine taking seventy years to adopt the uh, the t- tuberculosis people like having to be coaxed to not just spit on the street everywhere or whatever else and like just any you could you take any bizarre uh, uh epidemic situation or disease outbreak even this even the smallest little outbreak came along with something like that like have you ever heard of parrot fever by no, chance no, no effect no it, it, you, you'll you'll enjoy this so i i guess in like the 1920s um uh, when when uh international flights started becoming like more of a thing that people could do people started bringing back these tropical birds as uh as pets and gifts and stuff like that and then it created a market and there's this whole big thing people are packing up parrots close together in boxes and shipping them and these parrots would have like a a low-lying under you know they'd be carrying a virus that that uh, wasn't presenting itself. They weren't symptomatic, but then you'd clump them all together and they would start shedding and, and the virus would spread. And then there was like, uh, their, their bird feces would dry. It would get into humans and people would get what, what was, uh, the, the common name for it was parrot fever. It was actually the early origins of, of some of the early biohazard suits and stuff came from it. There, there was like some awareness of lab leaks that came from it. I think that NIH or something kind of originally started at that time. And so then they went about trying to tell people like, hey, the parrots that you're getting have are making people sick. And who would you guess had the most issue with this with this information? <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> you you want to take a guess? <laughs> uh, no, no. It, it's p- parrot owners and <laughs> and people that distributed parrots. You know, people that made their living off of off of the bird trade mm-hmm. were in denial of this and saying like this is a plot against us. They want to shut down our business and they're making all of this thing up and. And uh, and that just happens again and again. There's uh, I just saw a story of there's a deer virus going around. So they're trying to they're trying to raise awareness. People are breeding deer. And um, and and because of the close quarters, deer are getting more and more of this, yeah. this virus and all the people breeding deer are like the Fish and Wildlife Service. They're plotting against us. They just want to shut us down. And, <laughs> and so this is just like a natural human reaction. So then what happens when everyone on Earth is now impacted? by this thing you know everyone's occupation is impacted by this it's it's a difficult situation because it's Mm. just a natural way in which the brain seems to respond to lack of predictability lack of control new existential stressors and a brain well adapted not very well adapted for scientific thinking which was been around for a few hundred years yeah. and storytelling creatures. Yeah. So I could tell you something on a similar lines, which you'll find extremely depressing, which is that, <laughs> um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've you know, been studying the psychology of vaccine hesitancy and anti-vax for, for 
years. Um, and the sad thing is, is that there's nothing new about COVID and the psychological reaction and skepticism. Right. Nothing. Not not even right. one new thing. Um, so right. there's a beautiful article which which I'll I'll flick you afterwards. And maybe put it in the show notes. Not by me, by um, uh, uh, yeah, somebody called uh, Ann Carter is her name, and it's called oh, what's the title? Um, it's called a postmodern Pandora's box: anti-vaccine misinformation on the internet. It's published in the journal Vaccine in 2010. Right. Okay. Now people can that there's some nice tables in this. Really, you could you don't have to read the whole thing if you don't want to. Just go through the tables. But they just list off all of the stuff that they find. You know, they studied all all the anti-vax. You know, there's the measles, mumps, rubella, MMR, autism thing. You know, all of these anti-vax has been going on for ages, and all of those same things have been recycled yeah. for COVID. They haven't even changed them. So, for instance, you know, you've probably heard of the the, the VAERS, the VAERS, you know, adverse mm. reactions reporting system. That huge deal's been made about that. That's the anti-vax lobby has always used that, right? They've always used that. Right. That's that's, that's just a that's that's a, a problematic source of data, if you like, of adverse reactions. It's used for a specific purpose. It's misused deliberately. It, it's it's hard to believe it's out of ignorance because, but it seems to be. Um, but they've but they've repurposed that. Um, the the. The conspiracy theories, the the sort of you know fr- freedoms and and so on, the the alternative treatments, like you can go through these things and you'll see that there's nothing new under the sun. Um, mm. And in terms of our reaction to pandemics in general, even without vaccines, right? They they create they create this sort of sense of fear and just social discohesion and reaction against the system, and always have done. Um, so yeah. at the beginning of the pandemic, I read a, a nice little book, which is free, you know, you could read online too, which is um, uh, called, uh, it's by Daniel Defoe, and it's called uh, uh, A Journal of the Plague Year in London. And I forget the date, but it was in the 1600s sometime, I'm pretty sure, right? Um, so this is the Black Death, right? The plague. Um, and you read that, I was reading that book and I was going, oh, isn't that quaint? You know what I mean? You had... You had, you know, people, you know, you had these lockdowns, right? People, people, like people would literally get boarded up in there. They would actually board, build board infected people up in their homes. Um, these Some of the cures. first ever uh, de- delivered groceries and stuff, yeah. the, like the early versions of Amazon. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's right. That, that yeah, drop yeah. on the door and run. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know, like there was xenophobia because looking for people to blame, they blame the Dutch. You know, of course it was the Dutch. You know, the Dutch traders. Mm-hmm. Um, the yeah, but, you know, just, I, like, I would too. I blame the Dutch to this day for the Dutch do suck. Actually, you know, in, yeah. you know, in their defense. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um, you know, but basically, you you run through the list like the sort of paranoia, the the quack cures, the the sort of the prophets, and the and the oh, we have to do this now. The the anti government sentiment, you know, the government of the day was like an absolute monarchy, but it was the same deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and it all seems rather quaint, and then you and then you see all the same things happening today. So yeah, it's a bit sad, but there's nothing really new. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just kind of like, oh, this is, I mean, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up very, very like strictly religious, didn't believe in it and just got in at the, at the time at my early age, I didn't know that there was like not religious people. Um, I thought everyone just believed the same thing. And it's just like, this is, I guess this is just part of the environment that, you know, I'm in comes along with the um, people believing this belief system and um uh, yeah i i mean it it is it's <laughs> it's it's funny the, the ways in which we even have to defend ourselves to like <laughs> to, to be like i yeah you know, i like science a lot that i enjoy hearing about from virologists and things and people will be like are you getting your 
you're just listening to CNN and this, the, that, you're a sheeple for the, you believe the government, how could he, and, and then I have to go like, oh no, no, I, I don't watch the news, my goodness, <laughs> like you, you have to, you have to like, as some source of credibility, you have to be like, no, I don't get my information from the news right. at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's such a weird, uh, weird thing to have to go through i wanted to talk a little bit about because maybe we could i want to tie in some of the gambling stuff before this so we talked about a little bit about some of the cognitive biases that lead to this but i i'd like to go down that path just a little bit more because it's part of the trouble of uh having a human brain is it it takes shortcuts to learn things and it's and what it remembers is bias on, I, I, I have another podcast called mind under matter um and it's just me and uh, uh, amazing hilarious funny smart co-host for me and Nazer. he was talking about how when he was a kid he would suck his thumb and his uncle told him that if he kept on sucking his thumb he was going to turn into a monster and he believed that and so he stopped sucking his thumb and the thing is is like it's weird i feel like i feel like evolution like mimetically or something our 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 genes it's like evolution is just kind of raising individuals through these like mimetic cultural things or something because because it's if you think about trying to give a child an accurate reason for not sucking your thumb you're going to get into the background of dentistry and what might happen to you 30 years down the line if you keep on sucking your thumb and you break down the facts of this that's not going to get through to any child and so you use these really hyper salient examples to make an impact to Mm -hmm. drive that behavior to teach Mm -hmm. and then it can go wrong when someone uh you know believes in something that that isn't true or drives them in the wrong the mm. wrong way yeah yeah and, yeah hmm. uh, well i was just gonna say yeah i think a lot of those um um yeah um, um biases and heuristics uh you know it's important to remember they you know they all serve a function like they're not a they they exist because they're they're often useful all right and often work mm. um and but I guess the the common problem with with many of them in in the modern world is that they they you know we evolved in in a in a in a very different kind of environment yeah an environment mm-hmm. where you learn things via personal experience yeah or you learn them from like a close you know family or kin that kind of thing somebody mm-hmm. telling you or or, or what or, or literally watching them. Um, that that was how we got information, and mm-hmm. you know, and the stuff we were learning was 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 tangible. You know, it, it was was stuff that we could visualize, um, stuff that we could easily imagine. It wasn't you know highly abstract a lot of the time. Now, what we're doing now is where, you know, we've we've, we've created this wonderful technocratic. Uh, uh, technological civilization, but we've made our informational environment vastly more complicated, and we've extended the um, pool of individuals that we need to interact with and trust to some degree. You know, far beyond mm. you know the thirty or forty of your typical um, hunter gatherer uh, troop. Um, so you know, so so therefore, so much of our social reasoning. But also just um, assessment of risk and uncertainty, which is where that sort of gambling stuff comes in. Gambling is another one of these little sort of you know weak points in you know or rather it's an exploit of of one of the of of the weak points in our in our reasoning, uh, which can lead to harmful behaviour. Um, um, yeah, so it's you know it's that's if we understand that's what's causing us trouble, then again it's the kind of self awareness we can sort of take some steps to. 
you know, use our general intelligence or our, you know, central executive, which is a different kind of reasoning, not so much the intuitive kind of reasoning, the sort of gut feeling sort of stuff, which, which, which is the thing that, you know, it's, it's a great form of reasoning, nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's, it's our intuitions, it's our heuristics, it's very fast, it's very efficient. We have to stop more and more often now and actually sort of deploy the, the more effortful kind of hang on, you know, reflective kind of reasoning, which allows us to, you know, combat some of those heuristics. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think just being aware of the our, of of where we're, we're we're a little bit like um, you know primates in this wonderland that we've created, uh, and out of space, and out of time. We just we have to recognize that and just you know give ourselves a hand, help you know to to sort of navigate this you know really complicated informational environment. We have to learn different. Um, and not necessarily natural feeling methods of figuring out who to trust and how to think about risk and uncertainty. And the same kind of reasoning um, is required when when thinking about gambling or you know, f- you know finance stuff, um, where you're dealing often dealing with very small probabilities, very big very big rewards or costs, and likewise dealing with something like COVID, which involves some you know small probabilities and you know, big impacts and, you know, and how, how to weigh all that stuff up. Yeah. I mean, the, the calculations that you have to do, if, if you're, I mean, a lot of times I don't fault people for just the, you know, what, what I would sometimes define as incredulity, but uh, uh, it's just, it, it's so complicated to make a decision to, go to a gym and to like size up what my actual risk is and looking at airflow and okay, I'm the only one wearing an N95 mask. Most people aren't wearing a mask at all. How many people are in here? How much does this distancing stuff even do? And, uh, you know, like the insane amount of calculations. Um, and because it's also, we've, we developed these patterns over time and then the game changes. So I still see people like people not, not caring about wearing a mask or anything else and just not even thinking about COVID and then, uh, drop a piece of food on the floor and like, Oh, COVID. Oh, careful when you pick it up. Like, Oh no, that's not, that's not the game right now. That's not, that's <laughs> not the, that's not the main mode of transmission. It's the breathing in each other's faces that we're worried about and yes. changing those patterns is, is so difficult. Yeah. Um, sure. especially for someone like, I like change and I like little challenges like that. And, um, and I'm like, a, maybe a little bit, my personality is maybe a hair better suited for it. I'm higher <laughs> in openness and my environment was always shifting being on the road and everything too. So. Yeah. Well, you um, know, one, one, one good way to get around that. Cause I don't think too hard about a lot of these things. Cause I'm, I'm pretty lazy and I'm usually distracted by other things is, is to remember yeah. that, you know, we don't need to make perfect decisions. Right. We right, don't need to make right. absolutely optimal decisions. Right. We just need to make not terribly awful decisions. Right. 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 So, right. Right. You know. Um, so you know, by that standard, you know, in with to take COVID as an example, get vaccinated. Um, you know, practice practice moderate social distancing when appropriate. You know, mm-hmm. wear, wear a mask and in public situations, but even, but even that, you know, like, like you said, the situation is constantly evolving, um, Mm -hmm. you know, with, with the new Omicron variant in places like Australia, like we practiced zero COVID for a long time, quite, quite successfully. Mm -hmm. Um, we, now we, we have around 90% of people vaccinated and Omicron is well and truly in Australia. Um, we're not going back to some draconian restrictions to try to control it. Where essentially, mm-hmm. um, except perhaps if the hospitals get totally overwhelmed over the short term, because right. we're because we're aware that you know with the current you know um, risk ratio, we're just going to have to grin and bear the you know the you know of a relatively small people you know uh, well a very small percentage of of people who are who are properly vaccinated will get seriously ill with 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 the current Omicron strain, and um, we're going to accept that. So, mm-hmm. so for someone like me now, at least in my age group and my risk thing, then 
you know, actually, you know, now I've been boosted. Um, probably social distancing is not top of my. Um, right, right, um, right. Yeah. Right, right. I, I mean, just just in terms of, I, I mean, I'm just saying all of this in terms of the, not only the enormous amount of complexity that we, that we have faced our whole lives, but when when dramatic changes happen and trying to create change, it's it's just. It's very, very difficult um, for people generally. And um, yeah, the the other the other thing with some of the um, the trust with with medicine and the sci- mo- most people get their idea of what a scientist is like from um, from something they saw on TV or not most, a lot of people get their idea from, you know, like every scientist is wearing a lab coat, you know, you have some sort of archetype and, and in terms of their interactions with a doctor these days, people get like 15 minutes with their doctor and, you know, like a nurse is going through a, a sterile checklist that is exceptionally important, but not even nurses and doctors were averse to these like sterile, um, you know, disconnected checklists or when they were first introduced and, and you go in and, and there's not, there's not that human connection where like doctors that are well liked get sued less than doctors that don't have as good a bedside manner to independent of performance. Whereas if you go into some like GNC or wellness thing, you're, or a chiropractor, you're going to be very well taken. You know, if I go into a, a, a supplement store today, I will get all the care that I want. Like an employee in there will make all the time in the world for me. And they'll, you know, yeah. I, I can and have likewise. whatever I, hmm. yes, I can sorry, have energy. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. no. I mean, I just like, yeah. or, and then if I'm getting energy, I'm going to need something to sleep at night. And then like, you know, maybe I want to lose weight or maybe I want to bulk up a little bit. Well, if I'm bulking up, I'm going to need something for my joints as well. Who wouldn't want to boost their memory a little bit while we're at it. And, and <laughs> whereas your, your boring doctors, like trying to get a prescription out of out of a doctor, uh, you know, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the supplement place will hook you up with whatever, mm. with whatever you want and anything that, uh, that ails you. Yeah. And there's like, that um, human connection. Yeah. Yeah. Important, really important stuff. Um, like as, along with, um, the vaccine beliefs. So I also, uh, studied complementary and alternative medicine, um, and, you know, utilization and attitudes as, as well as part of this, constellation of health behaviors and health beliefs and you know what you said which is that the the social element and the the affirmation and the idea that you're getting individualized bespoke care not some generic Mm -hmm. kind of thing and that it's it's kind of got this growth model yeah and this optimization model attached to it and not kind of a deficiency rectification model not treating you like you're a piece of meat that is, you know, broken and needs to be fixed, mm. right? But treating you as this this beautiful flower that that, that mm-hmm. needs to be nurtured to to grow, right? Um, you know, it makes and like you said, the the amount of time that your, your general alternative medicine or, or supplement person or complementary person will spend with the client is and the way that will treat them is all focused on that uh, affirmation, making you feel good. And the social contact is really important. And a lot of people do go for, to them for that reason. And you shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't just sort of, you know, discard that or, or just discount that because, you know, that's important. We're social creatures. We, we, we love that shit, you know, bring it on, you know. I love I, a massage. Me too. <laughs> I, I remember in, um, in, in Japan, I, I went, I, I was taken to a, a, a friend of a friend's who practiced color therapy, which was, they had, they, apparently they buy all of these essential oils and they're all of the colors of the rainbow from the distributor. And, and they yeah. have all these, all these racks behind them. And then you choose, two colors uh, or, or you get to, you get, to, you get asked to think about your past or something in your friends and you choose two colors and then you pick another two colors and then they basically do a reading of you based on the colors you've chosen. And they tell mm-hmm. you, and there's a lot of touching of, 
you know, arms and hands and shoulders and so on. And all the while the 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 color therapist is is looking at you, paying attention to you and and talking to you about you, right? Talking, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. ab- about what's going on with you, about your future, about the stuff you care about and what you need and so on. And then and then the after the session will wrap up with they'll 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 prescribe you some essential oils basically to buy, right? Now, I I did that just 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 for a lark, and it was and not believing a single bit of it, right? Thinking this yeah. is absolute total bullshit. Um, it was great though; it was a lovely experience. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Of um, course, I mean you're getting human touch. You're getting told a beautiful story. It's and it's about you and how special and wonderful wonderful you are. You go to a fucking doctor's office. You're getting a colonoscopy. They're gonna find a lump on your balls. This is a horrifying, <laughs> yeah, un- <laughs> un- 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 uncom- uncomfortable, embarrassing, bel- belittling experience. There's nothing nice about it. But so, so this is the but this is the key takeaway, isn't it? That one of these things is optimized for one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the right. other thing is optimized for the other thing. And it's not right, you're not right. going to enjoy the experience. But that, if you, if you want to have that lump on your balls taken care of, don't go to the color right. therapist. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. If you want to yeah, feel good, go to the color words, therapist. Words to live by. Um, <laughs> yeah, because because I I think another just general rule is, um, you know, I I, I don't think Occam's razor is perfect, but I I think uh, lean boring. I think we I think we tend to attach to really. I even know, you know, I I'm I have to be a generalist. I talked with so many different people, and I've I've learned even from doing this show that, you know, e- even even within the even within science, it's really easy to grab on to the juiciest abstract and best title of the paper and most fascinating finding and those those things that you love uh, uh those fun facts that i love breaking out at uh at a get together with people or whatever else look and, that is uh, uh, yeah 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 look can i sorry can i interrupt that? of course I, yeah, I just yeah. i just want to heartily endorse that like lean boring that's uh, i'm gonna steal that actually because yeah that's that's a great way to describe it um because you know <laughs> like we we had this thing in social psychology called the replication crisis yeah uh, you, you may have heard of it um yeah but it it was driven by you know academics researchers supposedly social scientists um going for you know the trendiest sexiest this one simple trick, this sort of this little nudge will cause this surprising counterintuitive thing, these flashy results. You know, that was the thing that drove, you know, papers getting accepted into good journals and getting getting lots of citations and people would build their careers on these things. And yeah. they did a lot of shoddy and, you know, a lot of shoddy methodology sort of got them there. And it and then so it turns out a lot of it. A lot of it was completely debunked, and all right, and it was mm-hmm. big embarrassment, frankly. Uh, and now, so you know, psychologists themselves have had to relearn this fact, right? Um, steer away from the TED talkification of scientific findings, right? Where yeah, it's got, it's got this catchy kind of sexy sort of veneer, and and lean into the boring stuff, which is actually true, um, because uh- yeah. I've had to find that out because I present those juicy things to a guest. So I'll be like, oh, yeah, like this one study in there. All, <laughs> every time they're like, ah, actually, <laughs> that didn't replicate. And uh, <laughs> I've been just listeners know if they've been listening long enough. Oh, my goodness. I have been. Uh, I. Every episode, I get to find out how wrong I am. Uh, well, it's, about it's harsh, so isn't many it? things. Know, but, you know, that's not, <laughs> I'm you know, so used to it. <laughs> but it's really not. It's your kind fault, of a joy. You know? It's the fault of the. It's the fault of the journals, the editors, the the, yeah. the, the, the academic system. Um, we've, we've, we we did an episode on this. Um, um, and you know, like you in a better world, you would be able to read that article in that journal and go, ah, oh, that's an interest. That is an interesting finding. Great, I'm going to talk about this on my 
show. And, um, but mm. um, sadly, the the world is even messier and more complicated than we <laughs> than we thought. You, you have to be even careful. But we're, we're getting better. That's all I could say. We're working on it, Shane. We're trying. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even just because because there it seems like there's a little bit of a sciency if ish guruy things happening too in terms of like. When you mentioned, you know, looking for one simple thing, it seems like there's a lot of uh, life hack ad- advice. Hap- I'm a huge believer in finding the placebo that works for you. So so like as and, and, and there's something about like you finding it and making the connection yourself. And like this is my little individual visualistic ritual that I created, you know, and, and it gets me through the day. And I'm, I'm a big believer in a lot of that stuff when it doesn't negatively impact yourself or others, Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of, when I use this example, I don't know the first thing about it. I have no idea how much validity there is. It might be the best thing in the world, but it seems like, you know, now there's, there's the sciencey, uh, like this supplement does this or what you need is ice baths. Like I, I can't believe humans made it 200, uh, 200,000 years without shocking their system with the ice cold water. Like how did we even make it this far without doing regular ice bath things? And this will solve everything for you. If you mm. just do this and like, it probably it probably does something if you if if you jump in a bunch of ice water it probably does something especially if you believe that it does like it's like it's you're you're subconsciously you're going to be like well i didn't just jump in a tub of ice for no reason <laughs> <laughs> i didn't it has to be good for me you know yeah. but but there's a million things like this and because i got to uh, or like the neural feedback or whatever, all of this stuff is like, well, I believe that science will keep on stumbling across new ways of improving our lives. And maybe this is the cutting edge thing. Yeah, that's right. Just, yeah, as you said, stay, stay skeptical. Um, you know, even when there's a bit of a buzz around it in scientific circles, but then it gets, you know, it gets translated by, you know, science media into a bit more flashy and a bit, whatever and mm-hmm. and uh yeah so you know until it until it really really takes hold um yeah stay skeptical i'm still skeptical about the, the you know biofeedback neurofeedback and whatever yeah um i have no idea about whether ice baths demonstrably do everything good for you having said that i absolutely loved it especially um in japan but also in germany where i would you know, do these like you know, go to a really hot sauna, and then you jump in the really cold bath. Then you go I've to done a hot it too. Bath, and then you go outside and run yeah. in the snow or something. It feels great. Like I, I, lo- I love that. Um, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I, I have no idea whether, <laughs> whether yeah, any, whether like it does telomeres and yeah, right. I, I, I kind of doubt it, but the fact that it feels good is is good enough for me. Yeah. It, yeah. Right. 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 Um. Hmm. Cool. Well. Um, as we start wrapping up, I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's some other ways of combining some of the gambling stuff that you see. I, I mean, I, it, cause to me, it seems like there's some of the appeal of any of this, whether it's homeopathic stuff or conspiracy stuff or whatever is there's intermittent rewards that, that come along with it where uh you know some things some things are duds some stuff doesn't go anywhere and then something really does seem to work for you or or whatever else so there there's it these this idea that intermittent rewards drive motivation um to pursue things more is is something that i I feel like as we were talking about the kind of finding the slivers of truth out there in the, in the conspiracy things, do you think that there's anything going on with that where it's just, it becomes an addictive, um, uh, yeah, I think, um, look, I, I think the key, the key thing that links those things together is, is how, 
in for in both circumstances, we're not these um, dispassionate brains in boxes, right? We'd like to think of ourselves as, you know, logical, uh, rational, you know, you know, evidence mm -hmm. processing sort of you know things that that. But you know, in reality, the stuff that we think about is stuff that we care about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the outcomes outcomes about which we care because we are like real things. We're agents, we're entities existing in the world. We have wants and desires and hopes and fears and so on. So things, outcomes have a valence of goodness or badness attached to them. So if you look at um, the reason, the folk reasoning we do around something like a vaccine, you know, we're, we've, we've, we're, we're looking at negative outcomes and and you can see it's so transparent with someone like joe rogan who's you know afraid of <laughs> afraid of the virus afraid of the vaccine afraid of the government you see all these negative valence things kind of competing in his brain um mm -hmm. but you know that's that's true for all of us right and so and you're reasoning under uncertainty right because you know the the risk from vaccines are incredibly low but they're not absolutely zero either, right? There are neg the negative reactions. I had a nasty um, negative reaction with my booster shot. It's it's not serious, but it's not nothing either. So the, so there's, there's negative um, uh, outcomes, low pro uh, under very low probabilities. And if you if you catch COVID, even unvaccinated, right? Um, if you're not in a super high risk category, you'll probably be fine, right? You might have mm -hmm. a bad time but you're probably going to survive and you'll probably be okay. So you're mm -hmm. dealing with probabilities and you're dealing with outcomes that have a valence that have an, and, and therefore have an emotional aspect to them. Uh, the same thing. And, you know, so, and when we struggle sometimes when dealing with these sort of uh, abstract things and, and doing appropriate, you know, risk reward trade-offs, uh, the same thing is true with gambling. Um, the reason why gambling is fun and appealing is because we have an irrational attitude to it, right? If you take a perfectly, you know, my background is as, as a statistician. If you take a statistical approach to gambling, you wouldn't gamble, right? You're not going to find it fun. You actually have to park that, suspend disbelief. It's a bit like watching a movie, a fantasy movie. You have to suspend disbelief and to enjoy the movie. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're just going to be like, this is this is stupid, right? That's not real. He's just pretending. Yeah. He's not. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. to enjoy gambling, you you have to you have to put aside those things to enjoy. It. Now, when you have problems with gambling and make bad decisions with gambling, and this can also be true with stuff like you know other kinds of gambling type behaviors like investing. Um, getting you know involved in a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme or buying NFTs or crypto or something like that, you are dealing with a similar kind of reasoning about uh, a valenced outcome. In this case, rewards or, or you know financial rewards or financial losses, um, and and you're dealing with a very um, you know difficult to ascertain you know risk. Uh, profiles or, or probabilities of of the good thing or the bad thing happening. So you know it's just a thing that people struggle to act perfectly rational with. Um, there's been famous research done. People like Kahneman Tversky have documented a whole bunch of ways in which uh, people reason poorly about risk um, situations where there are very big gains or very big losses, but very small probabilities attached to them is where you'll often see this this big sort of um, discrepancy between actual human behavior and and the sort of optimal or logical behavior. So yeah, I think these things are connected and yeah, it's got to do with you know us being agents navigating this crazy world and dealing with uncertainty. Yeah, I mean well I mean I, I think part of uh part of what uh Emerson Traversky's work um, demonstrates is that the, the human brain did not evolve necessarily for accuracy. So, sometimes some of those biases, it is the case that we just don't have access to the information or it takes so much processing to sit and turn on that system too and blah, blah, blah. But there's also evolutionary features where it makes sense to spend 
too much on the lobster dinner to impress the date and all of oh, these yeah. things that that uh you know behavioral economists showed that sure. that is actually if you look at things in the span of evolutionary time there's uh behaviors that might not make sense right now but make sense from a genetic uh mm. perspective we have drives to overestimate our abilities because confidence helps us gain status and affiliate more and pursue yep. mates or even just get the hell out of bed in the morning and so yep. we're not accuracy uh, we're not we're not zeroing in on this perfect bullseye and just missing the mark we're actually <laughs> aiming somewhere that isn't the bullseye a yeah. lot of times yeah yeah no that i find that stuff fascinating too and i, I hope this study hasn't been debunked <laughs> with the replication <laughs> crisis but one of my favorite studies was the one showing that people with a more accurate like less biased view of the world were unhappier yeah yeah uh, yeah <laughs> and the people with a more biased more deluded view of the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and uh you know as you say the, the the purpose of our brains what they were built for was not for having an accurate view of the world the the, yeah. the purpose is to control our muscles our mouths you know our legs right. get us to do our bodies to do things in the world that allow us to do well Right to survive and prosper, which sometimes yeah, and means, then the, yeah, hmm. and and the, there's another aspect too in terms of like if if you if you compare COVID to vaccines, well, anyone if you just made it a variable, if you were like X, um, if if you get X, this will happen uh to you here's the st statistics of what could happen in your age group. If you get Y, here's the statistics of what could happen. It, you know everyone on paper would pick the x and then you reveal oh that's that's the you just chose the vaccine but it's the choosing and the action of going to do it's kind of it, 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 it it's reminiscent of the um the organ donation um studies of mm -hmm. of one one country having much lower rates almost flipped inverse rates of organ donation than another very comparable study in the netherlands or something like that and they find out that the the dmv has you know one one of it has an opt-in policy another has an opt-out so yeah. if you if you want to donate your organs, you need to check a box. So you're thinking through, you're at the DMT now thinking about your death and mortality and your yeah. organs being ripped out and everything else to, before you check that box. Where yeah. the other one, you have to uncheck it and people would just rather just not not do anything just yeah, not make a decision because we prefer, we'd at prefer all. not we prefer not to think about it basically which, and yeah and with 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 COVID, it's like it, well, if you if you get COVID and spread COVID, well, you didn't try to, you never intended to. Whereas if 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 you get a vaccine and something goes wrong, you intentionally okay. got that vaccine. Yeah, you know that's right. Yeah, that's right. Then that's one of the <laughs> one, that's one of the biases that we have, and uh, you know philosophers look at it with the with the trolley problem, right? Which is the yeah, right, right? Yeah, you know, they you know we we sort of prefer the option where we cause the same amount of, or we incur the same amount of risk or harm, but if it's through our inaction rather than action, it's kind of we're less we're less culpable for it, um, and therefore we prefer that uh, option. But I think the other you know the interesting thing you mentioned is about the sort of default option too. Um, people do tend to you know whatever you perceive as the default, you'll tend to defer to. But the other interesting thing there is the is the angst, the existential angst, right? So, mm -hmm. so that organ donation thing—it's a perfectly rational thing to do. Obviously, like you know, you're dead, right? It's it it doesn't nothing's gonna you know nothing's gonna matter to you anymore, right? So so why not, right? But um, but but people don't tick it, and as you say, it's because they don't want to think about it. Why don't they want to think about it? It's because it triggers these sort of existential fears 
around death and dismemberment <laughs> right. and, you know, horrible You're stuff. trying to get your plates <laughs> re- renewed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't come to the DMV to deal with this shit, did you? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like 10 o'clock, you haven't had enough coffee, you're not, you're not, you're not ready for this. Um, but I, I think that's got a lot to do with it. And you're like, where, where do you yeah. see the conspiracy theories cropping up? Where do you see the sort of cults and the conspiracy, um, um, uh, the, um, like irrational thinking and the fallacies come in, you tend to, like, they don't occur randomly across different topics, right? Like there's relatively mm-hmm. few conspiracies around, I don't know, I'm trying to think, <laughs> shirts. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just looking at something mm-hmm. random, right? Like we, the thing that are, things attract, um, the, the, the topics that attract these these strange cognitive distortions do so not for cognitive reasons, but for sort of emotional, existent, uh, you know, reasons that relate to existential fears. So, so anything to do with death, anything to do with sickness, um, anything to do with you know threats to your to, to you, your family, your you know the children. Think of the children, um, um, you know, or, or things that that sort that feel as if they diminish us, make us make us somehow lesser. Um, you know, the, these are things that, you know, in, you know, trigger quite strong emotional reactions. And, and those, those are the topics that tend to attract, um, you know, the, the, the various conspiracy theories and where these, you know, fallacies and biases tend to come into play. So, you know, the interesting thing about this topic is that it's not purely cognitive. Yeah, it, it, it's got this emotional aspect to it too and it's the interplay between that like our wants and desires and hopes and fears plus the way we sort of think about things and process information and on top of that that's the sort of psychological level on top of that we have the whole sociological stuff going on too so it Mm -hmm. matters an awful lot whether you're an american whether you're an australian whether you're a libertarian whether you're a socialist type person whether you're you know, super, you know, fundamentalist religious or not. These are all sociological things and they drive a lot of our thinking as well. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's fun stuff. It keeps a, keeps a psychologist like me in business anyway. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I could, I could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, well, I, I think another little bit of advice that I like to give people is, um, I've been able, I've been fortunate in that, um, I got into taking online courses when, when they were first becoming available like 15 years ago or whatever. And now just to watch them proliferate and there's just so much incredible, like you can take courses from Yale and Stanford and all these. And, uh, there's a one on course era called intellectual humility, um, that I'm taking. We kind of mentioned that earlier, but there's edX and great courses it's such a i i think i think if you really like want to nerd out on virology or like understand what's going on with these vaccines taking just a 101 basic course on infectious disease or something like that it you're not you're not you're you're not going to crack the case but you're going to get rid of the dunning kruger stuff you're going to become more informed and you're going to be in my opinion less susceptible to the kind of cherry picking confirmation bias stuff um that happens so highly recommend that i want to recommend you uh check out decoding the guru do you have um do do you have some episodes that you've you've especially enjoyed oh well, you know, or if you want to talk some shit and talk about some of the gurus out there, there that you really think are people taking people for a ride right now that people should stay away from. You've you've been so every time I've tried to talk a little bit of shit, you've you've grounded ever the conversation and it's so balanced and exactly <laughs> what you should be saying. <laughs> but, uh, oh. so, uh, uh, here I am hoping for the juicy stuff, just like I'm just like I'm warning people against doing. But yeah, have you had any episodes that you've you've personally just really enjoyed or or a good starting place for people? That's a good question. Um Oh look, oh gee, 
different people have uh, given us great feedback on different episodes. It's really hard to say. It depends what you like. Like, like we've we've dunked really hard on characters like Gadsad. We've we've dunked on Jordan Hall. A, a char- He's been a very famous guy, so we felt a bit bad about dunking on him. So some people enjoy that, right? And enjoy yeah, enjoy yeah, the dunking, yeah. and 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 we do too. I um, had God sat on twice on my show before he got into all this stuff because I loved the uh, evolutionary conspicuous consumption yeah, type stuff. I yeah. I loved that stuff, and I then love it. I oh love that my, stuff too, man. So I, 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 my I sympathize. Yeah. goodness, he turned into just the worst. Yeah, this is this is. <laughs> It's, this is your brain on the culture war, eh? Um, but, you know, if you want a debunking or not a debunking, if you want our analysis of the guru-esque techniques um, yeah. that people like Peter McCulloch and Robert Malone do, then go to go to our recent episode. We did a, a recent one on Joe Rogan. You know, somehow the ones in which I'm suffering the most because the content is just painful is often the one the audience enjoys more. Mm. <laughs> I enjoy I, I enjoyed doing Carl Sagan. Um, but people, uh, uh, that one doesn't quite have, doesn't run the numbers like some of the other ones. So I think people mm. just like to see me suffer. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they, uh, you know, I think that more and more what I'm seeing because early on. So another thing is, am I keeping you too long? I'm just having such a wonderful time chatting yeah, with you. We we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, uh, so. I did a lot of various themed shows to like try to figure out ways of communicating science and I, and I've uh I have a long history of psychedelic use as well. I and I was in the closet about it for a long time and I start but I do some jokes on stage. Once podcasts came around, some people like asked me about my experience. Next thing I know, I'm like known as some DMT guy cuz I have like a sciency breakdown of what i think is happening in these like very bizarre mystical seeming experiences and um and then i'm like oh i I could put a show together no i start touring around with a um with a uh psychedelic show and so because of that i got like a pretty decent like psychedelic wellness following i was on rogan so i have like a I had a fair number of his fans and stuff. And and so when all of this happened, I felt like I was like undercover in QAnon or something like that, because I was like, I saw all of the reaction from not everyone, but aspects of that. There's a lot of infighting in the psychedelic community right now and everything. Mm -hmm. There's a more sciencey side and then there's a more like guru-y side Mm -hmm. and And so I was like tweeting about this stuff really early on, like May 2020. And people were like, what's Shane going on about? (laughs) Like, what is they they didn't uh, people didn't see all the conspiracy stuff uh, happening. Like I I kind of got the um, got the preview. Yeah. Yeah. I I got the hipster conspiracy stuff like before anyone heard it on road. I I knew about ivermectin and things like long before nine months before Brett Weinstein was like emergency episode. Everyone needs to know about (laughs) because he's actually just pandering to a need that's already there and not actually finding a thing. But um, but yeah, so it was it was really it, i say all this because i've seen a shift in the tides i've seen i've seen people see like oh this is like january 6th was a thing where it's like oh this is what you mean yeah. by these like wacky conspiracy yeah. types like people yeah. just didn't know how much of it was out there i think yeah like i mean it's just gonna, it, it's a fascinating phenomena to 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 watch, you know, unfold, and I sort of appreciate a lot of it is kind of on the sort of I don't know, not it, it's it's uh, I was going to say right wing, but it's kind of not right wing in the traditional sense. It's this postmodern, not always, yeah. It's and it's this postmodern version of reactionariness somehow against everything, you know, waves arm, you know, gesticulates wildly, sort of thing. It's it's this new form of. Of you know, there's this, there's been a reorientation, I guess, in the political dimensions. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, so someone like um, Brett Weinstein, who will always signals 
you know, describes himself as, you know, liberal, progressive, whatever. But honestly, when when you look at the impact and you look at the appeal, it's it's anything but. It's it, it's it is this conspiratorial, um, anti institutional, um, and alternative health, naturalistic kind of philosophy that sort of undergirds it all, and it's a, it's just a, a an fascinating phenomenon to see to watch unfold, even though it is disturbing. Um, like mm-hmm. this sort of like I always like in Australia anyway the anti-vaxxers movement or people who are vaccine hesitant always used to be on the political left, right? So it used to be the hippy dippy, you know, natural is best yeah. kind of thing, and that that was yeah. like a left wing thing, right? Um, right? And and they were the ones that were kind of anti science, right? They were like you know my 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 chakra crystals and whatever is. You right. know, it's better, it's better than this, and it's got a, it's all based on you know indigenous ways of knowing or whatever, right? Now, now we see this complete shift, right? Where that, 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 that woo, is is now forming part of this sort of, you know, postmodern right affiliated thing, and you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's another podcast called um, the Conspirituality Podcast, sort of conservatism and. And spirituality, which actually focuses on this, but like I'm genuinely, mm. you know, surprised at that. It's taken me a while to catch up and wrap my head around that. I think partly because it's kind of came from America, right? and it's, it's come, it's only coming to Australia um, a, a bit later on. So, you know, seeing what's going on there, seeing the way in which Brett White, Brett and Heather uh, Weinstein, you know, got on board with this alternative train. They've they've got they've got this addiction to what we call scientific hipsterism, right? Where yeah, they, yeah. they think of themselves as scientists, but really what they're yeah. addicted to is their own unique bespoke kind of interpretation of things. They latched on for whatever reason to to the ivermectin idea. Um they and they latched on to this vaccine skeptical idea and Man, have they doubled down on it and tripled well, down on it? Well, I mean, if, if you watched, this- mm. I, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I'm such a fucking interrupter when I'm excited no, to ahead. talk about a subject. Do it. Um, <laughs> um, well, it, it, you know, as as someone that had like a, you know, I have my own chip on my shoulder about all this shit because of how much I was attacked. So I'm I'm biased in my own ways, but but um um. But if, if you watched early on, what happened first was it was like January 6th happened like the these the intellectual dark web that got that hopped on board, like the defend like populist pandering of like defending Trump stuff when that happened and fighting for free speech and and that sort of thing. It started fizzling out as like Trump was exiting and off Twitter and not being inflammatory every day. And, and like things were calming down and everyone's like, okay, maybe we're done moving past this. And then right after that, Rogan did the first like vaccine hesitant thing that he got a uh, controversial media attention for. And then Brett was one of the first ones to come running to his defense and spin up some thing. And then after that, he started searching for alternatives to the, so it, it's not, it's not like these people aren't like breaking, finding this thing and then bringing it to a platform like, Oh, and then Joe, maybe Joe Rogan can get it out there. They're instead being like, here's what, Joe will want to hear. This is what will get booked on the show. This is what his audience will like. And um, so there has, I'm going to do a dramatic yes. reading of a Brett Weinstein treat, uh, tweet for you. Um, just <laughs> just to give people like a, a, a um, little bit of a flavor <laughs> of, of what they should be kind of looking out for. Um, <laughs> this is, I mean, first um, off dark horse podcast. Okay. And then um, professor in exile. I like the, I always picture like a, a leather lab coat and like, uh, like th- with the collar up, you know, like the bad boys of, of yeah. uh science reluctant radical and hard to silence so um that's in his twitter bio but the, here's this is so 270 
science health professional science communicators wrote some letter uh, wanting Spotify to like acknowledge a thing or do a disclaimer, whatever. I don't have a, I don't have a stake in who knows the messiness of the subjective reality of what is freedom and what we should do about censorship. Not, not my game. I care about objective reality is what I uh, care about. So I don't like throwing out my opinions on that as much, but um, Brett comes running to his defense that this is just amazing. Um, I'm going, so here's the dramatic reading and this is, this is what bullshit sounds like everybody. They rigged the game. They, of course, they rigged the game monopoly on mass communication, captured government, platforms that shape our thoughts and relationships they don't care that we hate them so long as we're frightened and dependent but they missed some stuff the human spirit and joe rogan top that list <laughs> oh, wow. yeah, i know <laughs> Uh, can yeah, you imagine so over the top <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I not a hint i imagine rogan's got to be blushing when he sees shit like that like you think he ever he's got to be like guys you don't need to do that i'm a i can take care of myself i can handle fucking cuff yeah. um but yeah it's what it's, one, what one thing one thing you notice in those circles is just the amazing level of flattery that they direct yeah. Stra- you know, right. tactically, strategically towards one another, you know, sometimes right. mutually and sometimes up to, 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 to the great God of all, um, you know, heterodox media, Joe Rogan, uh, you know, right, he, he's, right. he's been compared to like, you know, the great Khan, like a bar- barbarian King who, who brings the, come, you know, bring science man to his court. Like, come on, <laughs> dance for me, science man, <laughs> show me science. Yeah. <laughs> and, right. uh, like, but you know, it's so cringe, isn't it? And uh, it I, I, is I'm, I'm continually in my, like, there's an inexhaustible font of that coming from both brothers and as well as other gurus. And uh, I'm still amazed that it works, but it, it somehow, yeah. it, it seems you, you can't go too far for people. People will lap that shit up. Um, <laughs> This part of it's amusing. I don't, I don't feel like overly attached to this reality anyway. So sometimes I'm like, you know, eh, it's funny. You got to have a laugh. It is funny. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Do, do you have other things that you wanted me to direct people to? Uh, just uh, if people want to look at your, any of your other work, just Matthew Brown, B-R-O-W-N-E. Um, and like, check out any of your gambling research or anything yep. like that yeah yeah great yeah you could if, if you're if you if you care about my rather you know, my, remember, my you listeners are nerds um you know mundane boring research my yeah, listeners okay, well, that's, are that's way that's, about that's my that. research it's really boring so <laughs> I, I i bet i so bet that's find, not the can, case gambling research is fascinating but yeah so you can find you. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, my Google Scholar profile's got all that stuff on it. Uh, you know, awesome. just the Google Scholar, the Google Scholar search will bring me up if if you want to f- find that stuff. Um, but yeah, no, we're, we're enjoying uh, decoding the gurus, and um, that's that's really all I'm doing apart from my day job. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me. This is such a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thanks, Shane. It was really fun. Great to talk. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week. <laughs>